afternoon. My name is Dave Norton from Discovering New England History. We're going to bring you part four of the King Philip's War, of course, which is all took place in New England. And we'll go to the next slide. Now, sort of a recap here uh, of our first three episodes from July 1675, where it started in uh, Swansea to February 1676 now. At this point, you can see all the different towns that were attacked. Uh, South Dartmouth, Middleborough, Brookfield, South Deerfield, Hadley, South Kingston, Rhode Island, Lancaster, Massachusetts, Medfield. They were all attacked during the first, uh, first few months of the war. And basically all the buildings were uh, completely uh, torched and burnt down. And we'll go to the next slide. Now, this is a great place to visit. Over in uh, Simsbury, Connecticut, called Talcott Mountain. And I took this picture here. And if you look at it, it's probably what it looked like back in the, the 1600s. All the corn growing and the large mountain in the back. And King Philip made it all the way here to uh, Simsbury, Connecticut. And there was a large uh, settlement in Simsbury. And the plan was to attack and destroy the town. We'll go to the next slide. Now, if you take a closer look here, something called King Philip's Cave. And I circled it in red. If you look real close, you can see a dark spot in the middle there. That's the cave. And that's the position where King Philip was said to have gone inside that cave and looked down on Simsbury. It's called Talcott Mountain. And the elevation of that uh, is over 900 feet. It's almost as tall as the uh, Empire State Building. And it's amazing. You, you, um, if you drive there, you go around the back of the mountain on the back side of here. And then, but then you still have to walk up to the top and it takes you 45 minutes to an hour on the steep ascent just to get to the top. It's a, quite a place to visit. We'll go to the next slide. And this is a great shot. Here's that cave in the top. And I circled in red. You can see the uh, visitors. <laughs> just to give you a relative size of this. And it's, you have to be extremely careful. When you co come out the backside of the mountain and, and then you finally get to the front and you're where you can look out, there's no fence or nothing. Um, definitely hold on to your, uh, your children if you're up there because they can turn around and they can walk right off the side of this cliff. And you can see that. There's no fence or anything. You just walk right off. Um, we'll go to the next slide. Now, it is said that in March 1676, all the uh, Wampanoags attacked the town of Simsbury. Okay, and there's a picture of uh, King Philip. And over on the, um, the right here is a photograph taken from inside the cave. And of course, nowadays it's very dangerous and it won't let anybody go in there. But uh, this picture was taken by uh, several young college students who uh, had ropes and whatever repelled down the side of the mountain and went in there and took it. And um, I'm glad they did. This is an incredible shot. It said that uh, King Philip just stood there with his arms crossed and he watched the whole town of Simsbury. Now the folks in the town knew something was up. So they, a day before, they vacated it. So there was no one in the town and no one was killed. But they completely torched the town, completely leveled it. And it was said that even, uh, even up to a year later, they never returned to that town. It was just uh, completely destroyed. We'll go to the next slide. Now, things are uh, turning around a little bit. Um, Captain Pierce, he uh, had a group of militia. And he got some in intelligence that the, uh, the Narragansetts were kind of um, in this area of uh, actually uh, Rumford 
East Providence. And uh, so he got together a group of militia right here at the um, meeting house site where that monument is, got them all assembled, and he was going to find out exactly where they were and attack them. We'll go to the next slide. Now, they, got, they basically stayed here at the Reverend Samuel Newman House site, and that, that's the foundation of the original house, but that's, uh, you can still see that on uh, Greenwood Avenue, and that's where the militia assembled. And I did some research, and a lot of the folks on the Ring and the Green, of course, that was called Rehoboth back in the day, were part of the militia. So I got Michael Pierce, of course, who was the captain, and these other folks here, you're probably familiar with some of their uh, last names. John Miller, Samuel Reed, John Fitch, John Reed, Thomas Mann, and Benjamin Buckland. They were all part of this militia. Go to the next slide. And what they did is they all started going across the, almost to the uh, Blackstone River, which is in... Uh, uh, Central Falls, Rhode Island, March 1676. There's a marker there right now on the other side of the Blackstone that you can see. And this marked the site of what they referred in history as Pierce's Fight. I'll go to the next slide. And what happened here, um, the Narragansett's absolutely a textbook way to uh, cause an ambush. What they did is they were uh, over 900 warriors and they took a small group of maybe 12 or 13. They had them across the uh, Blackstone River, just swooping it up and everything else. And of course, Captain Pierce saw that and he figured there's only 12 or 13 of them. Let's go. So they all went after him, crossed the Blackstone River. <laughs> and then all of a sudden they were cut off. The uh, Narragansetts went on the other back side of the river where they were and they all were there and they cut them off on the front side. It completely surrounded them. So it basically was 80 militia against 900 Narragansetts. And of course the fight was with muskets, swords, war clubs, bows and arrows. I mean the, the whole woods was just full of Narragansett. Um, and they basically had this as a sort of a, a payback for the um, Great Swamp fight. Now, 80 men fought off 900, and the fight lasted two hours long. You can imagine the, uh, the muskets firing, the arrows going. I mean, it just, and they all were basically, um, basically massacred. Not too many escaped. So we'll go to the next slide. And there's a great picture on the bank there of the uh, Blackstone River today. And some of those that were in the Ring of the Green, I took down what happened to them. There's some research. John Fitch, he was killed. John Miller Jr. was killed. Thomas Mann was severely wounded. John Reed was killed. Samuel Reed escaped. It was a huge Narragansett victory. And we'll go to the next slide. Now, nine men were captured alive and they were taken three or four miles north to Cumberland, Rhode Island, March 26, 1676, a place called Nine Men's Misery. Now, there's a main trail if you walk it, and this is where you're, I'm standing on a main trail here when I took it, and you don't even see the marker, you don't even see where it was. You really have to know where this is. You have to go up this hill and find out where the uh, Nine Men's Misery uh, monument was. So we'll go to the next slide. And there it is. So they took all these nine up there and they had a ceremony and uh, they, they killed them all one at a time and buried them right here. Nine men's misery. Now, uh, a little, little time, short time later, uh, they dug up some of the remains here and uh, they only identified a fellow by the name of Benjamin Buckland. He was from Rehoboth and he was killed. And the only reason they identified him, he had for some reason a set of uh, 
double lower teeth, and that's how they had identified him. And they put this stone on top of it all um, to mark this site. So we'll go to the next slide. Now, we're going back to the Ring, ring of the Green. Um, two days later, of course, all the Narragansetts were all in that area. They attacked the whole settlement of Rehoboth. You know, and back then, there, there it is. This whole settlement was attacked. And, of course, um, you know, a lot of the people were inside, uh, <laughs> or they went to the garrison houses there. Uh, it was uh, unbelievable. We'll go to the next slide. And the whole town was torched. And this area uh, was called Rehoboth back then. I did some research. Um, the area includes the entire city of uh, Seekonk, Rumford, and Rehoboth. 1,500 Narragansett warriors came down, and they just went through house to house and torched everything. Buildings destroyed. 45 houses, 21 barns, two corn mills, one sawmill, a total of 69 buildings were torched. It was quite uh, quite an attack, quite a part of uh, history in that area. We'll go to the next slide. Now, the burning of Rehoboth, um, we spoke about this. These four houses are built on um, the early foundations that were of the houses that were burnt on the ground. And there's Hill House, still there today. Uh, and so if you see these uh, four houses, um, that's the only, uh, it, only thing we can find, or trace we can find left of the foundations that were actually burnt during this when they had attacked this whole area. It was a big Narragansett uh, victory. We'll go to the next slide. Now we're going to move along here a little bit uh, northeast of this area. Um, town called Sudbury, which is um, King Philip's War. That's the closest uh, King Philip's group got to Boston. And there's a huge monument right here commemorating the uh, Sudbury attack. And of course, once again, the folks that were in the uh, Ring of the Green, a lot of them, uh, the, the young men, of course, men, of course, were volunteered to be militia, and of course they would send them to all these different sites. And I just put a few of the names down here. John Martin, Jacob Leonard, Robert Miller, Samuel Cooper, James Smith, Thomas Reed, and they were all involved in the uh, Sudbury attack. And we'll go to the next slide. And this was a, an, an amazing attack. They, um, the whole town, once again, they went through and they uh, started burning building after building and the town's people went to their fortified garrison house. It's called Hay uh, Haynes Garrison. This was back in April 21st, 1676. And I went there, you can see on the right, there's the actual foundation of the house that's still there today. And what happened was uh, all the townspeople were in this, finally in this house, and they were attacked night and day. But they couldn't, uh, it was a great defense, and the, um, this was the only actual uh, fight in Sudbury where all three of the North, uh, the North American Indian tribes were together. You got the Narragansetts, the Nipmunks, and the Wampanoags. They were all together, which is amazing, and this is the closest they came to uh, Boston. But in this particular house, they tried to do like in Brookfield. They sent a uh, cart down with uh, burning <laughs> hay and straw and it set it on fire to try to burn out the house. And on the way down, it was very rocky. The wheels hit, hit the rocks and everything else fell apart and nothing happened there. Then they, um, when the battle was over, many years later, they uh, of course took apart the house and they found that the second floor the whole second floor was lined on the inside wall up four feet with bricks. And I wondered what was that all about on the second floor? 
And uh, they did a lot of this now. I did some research on garrison houses. They uh, lined the walls, second floor, four feet up with bricks. So that when they had they uh, had their beds up there and they were sleeping, they knew that the uh, if anyone shot a musket through the wall, it wouldn't hit them when they're asleep in bed. Kind of an interesting story here. And we'll go to the next slide. Now, we're going to start this story of Mary Rowlandson. And her husband was a minister, and they lived in Lancaster, Massachusetts. And um, her husband uh, knew something was going to happen here, so he said, we're very under, not prepared at all. I'm going to leave and go to Boston and get some more militia. So he left. And while he was gone, unfortunately, um, Everyone attacked, all the uh, Native Americans, they all attacked uh, Lancaster, house to house and everything else. Um, all, all the men that were still there, uh, they were all killed and they were all scalped, and, uh, but they saved all the uh, women and children and they had them captive. So Mary Rowlandson and her son Joseph, 14, and her another daughter, Mary, 10, and Sarah Six were all captured February 1676. And it's a dead of winter now. Whatever they had on, that's it. And they were captured and they were just taken, taken uh, prisoner. And this begins this incredible, incredible uh, survival story. Now, uh, Mary's young daughter was actually shot. It was a flesh room right, right through her and actually got Mary in the side. But uh, they didn't care, and she was determined to keep her daughter. So she, you can see the picture there on the right. She, uh, they made all these uh, women and children uh, walk, and of course uh, they were on horseback. And the way they went out into the woods. Go to the next slide. And this is a great picture. You can see up the hills, down into the woods, 24 women and children were captured by groups of uh, Narragansett, Nipmucks, and Wampanoags. And they took them all through the woods, and then they would have different campsites, and they kept on the move so that the English would not uh, follow them and, and, and free them, and capture them. So it was, it was quite an incredible story. So we'll go to the next slide. And I made this map up. I was really curious. Uh, I can imagine, you can imagine it's the dead of winter, women and children, and you can see, you got a map of Massachusetts right there in the center. And you can see all the different towns. They call that rem removes. Every time they had a different campsite, they call it removes. So in this period from February through May 1676, um, the women and children that were in captivity, had, they had 20 different, every night they had a move so they wouldn't get detected. And they were captured for almost three months or 11 weeks. And the whole trek was from Lancaster all the way up into Vermont, and then from Vermont all the way back to Lancaster. 75 miles each way, or a total of 150 miles, they had a walk in the dead of winter. And if you know the area, I just wrote down some of the towns that they, uh, they stopped at. Lancaster, of course, Sterling, Princeton, New Braintree, Barrie, Petersham, New Salem, Athol, Northfield, Vernon, Vermont, and Chesterfield, New Hampshire, dead of winter. It was a it, it was a it was a brutal uh, uh, captivity. We'll go to the next slide. And just to give you an idea, they're, now they're all heading west. You can see what the uh, the terrain looked like. And of course, they never took. Uh, <laughs> trails or whatever, they had to go through all the snow. The women had to get their, you know, if they had a small creek, they just made them walk through bare feet or whatever, the icy water. Um, if they complained, they would make an example and they would just uh, uh, kill somebody and, just, and then Russ would not complain at all. They just kept it, kept it going. Go to the next slide. Now you're saying, what in the world do they eat? How did they exist here? And that's a, a typical, uh, there's a fire there and they're 
one of their removes. And I'll, I'll read some of these here. Uh, <laughs> and of course, the, cat, uh, the women and children didn't want to eat anything. But after two weeks, uh, th these meals were uh, luxuries to them. OK, boiled horse legs with broth, Indian corn with roasted ground nuts, roasted horse liver, parched sweet pancakes cooked in bear grease, broiled deer blood broth, they used to drink that, roasted venison, tree bark they ground into meal, and roasted bear meat. And uh, that's what they existed on. And we'll go to the next slide. Now, they got through to New Braintree. And that's where uh, Sarah Rowlandson, uh, Mary's daughter, six-year-old daughter, she finally died from her wounds. And what they did is they buried her on a hill. And when I was out there, I happened to uh, stumble on this monument. It was my, took, piqued my curiosity, took a look at it. And it tells a story there of uh, where Sarah and her mother were captured and where she actually uh, died. And that's exactly where she's buried in her brain tree. And they continued on. They separated Mary from her children. She never saw them through this whole uh, 11 week trek. So she had no idea, first of all, where she was going. Second of all, if she could even live at all on this, and, and third of all, she had no idea what happened to her other children. So we'll go to the next slide. And you can see what it was like in the winter here. They just uh, kept on going, continued north. Now it's into March, 1676. I can't even imagine uh, this truck to walk. Go to the next slide. Then they came to the Connecticut River. And the story says uh, uh, the knit monks uh, basically made log rafts and they went right across the river to the other side. And you can see that I had this picture taken uh, in the winter. You can imagine they came off the top of the, uh, the high ground there, went down the hill, had some rafts and went across there. Go to the next slide. And they finally got all the way up to uh, Vermont, New Hampshire, April. Now it's getting a little bit warmer, 1676. And the Indian, Indian tribes that were all together, all of a sudden, they were running out of food. Um, they had to do something. So they had the 24 women and children captives, and their idea was to ransom them off for food and uh, money, which the English had. So they had to make their way all the way back down to that area where they first uh, captured them. We'll go to the next slide. So they came all the way down to a place in Princeton, Massachusetts, Redemption Rock. You can see that over here on the right. All, and they walked all the way through the forest. You can imagine the dense forest on this walk. Women and children walked 150 miles in 11 weeks. And we'll go to the next slide. And there's a picture when I, we, I was there, Redemption Rock. Princeton, Massachusetts. And Mary was very um, self-sufficient. She, uh, she stayed alive by helping out the, uh, um, the Wampanoags. If they need something sewed, she was a seamstress. If they needed things like that, she was going to do some cooking. And she found out if she was resourceful, they would keep her and her daughter alive. Now, this site here is where they got exchanged. We'll go to the next shot. And on the side of that rock, you probably can't see it here in that photo. Um, it, it's printed on, it's actually carved into the rock, still there today, of the story. I'll read this. Upon this rock, May 2nd, 1676, was made the agreement for the ransom of Mrs. Mary Rowlandson of Lancaster between the Indians and John Hoare of 
Concord. He was the man that actually got the money up for her ransom. King Philip was with the Indians but refused his consent. Mary was ransomed for 20 pounds and baskets of corn and different things like that. And so it was for their survival and she uh, was uh, returned back to civilization. We'll go to the next slide. Now the part of the story was amazing. I'm not sure anybody knows this. Her, her other daughter, Mary, Mary Ten, was still alive, but she was in the other part of New England and she showed up in uh, Rhode Island <laughs> And they were asking to have her ransom, and Reverend Noah, actually N Newman, um, he went around in, in this area and he collected money from the Ring of the Green families to pay for Mary's daughter for her ransom. She did. They they turned her over and they kept her in this in this house right here, which is there today. And then when she got a little bit better, um, they had a wagon that was going heading to Dorchester, where her mother and was reunited with her father. And she was reunited with her mother. And, and that's an important part of this story. We'll go to the next slide. And that's the site today where she was captured. And there's a plaque right there. Of course, the house has long been gone. Lancaster, Massachusetts. And we'll go to the next slide. And she wrote a book. <laughs> it published 1682, six years later, about all her experiences and it became, became the first American bestseller. And there it is right there. Describes her everything that happened to her. It's 44 pages long, and it was just thousands of these books were sold back in the day. The first bestseller in the United States liter, literary history. Just an amazing story. If you pick that up, and I have it right here, the book on Amazon.com, and in the middle of it, it's interesting, it's only 44 pages, and believe me, she, uh, <laughs> she's quite the writer, and she spares uh, a description. If you read this book, you can't put it down, you are with her. So once again, uh, this is Dave Norton from Discovering New England History, and have a good evening. <laughs>